Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Shen and I'm a faculty member here at Radius Globe Management in University of California, San Diego. I'm also a faculty director for the Institute for Supply Chain Excellence and Innovation. And just to give you a little bit of a background on this uh, webinar on accelerating North American value supply chain in Mexico, uh, this webinar originated from the project that we conducted last fall with Helen Wang and some ready students on post-globalization movement. Starting from 1980s, trade frictions have been lifted and supply chains got more globalized, chasing cheaper labor, in particular in East Asia, and more stretched out as a result. Right? However, since 2010, due to geopolitics and increased labor costs in Asia, we observed that supply chains got rebalanced and more regionalized. Right? Another underlying factor is the time. With longer supply chains, it takes more time, which then increases risk ex exposures and reduces resilience. So like what we saw in Suez Canal blockage and COVID. Right? Now, considering this North American market and more regionalized supply chain led us to integrate more with Mexico. Right? So in January, we initiated a symposium and a workshop on cross-border region and building up the community, including San Diego and Tijuana. And in March, we actually had a follow-up symposium, extending it and incorporating the whole Mexico region. And at that time, the feedback that we got was we need to understand more about what Mexico's capabilities are for the investors, as well as what capabilities are missing or needed to cultivate further within Mexico, which led to this webinar on accelerating North American value supply chain in Mexico. Okay, with that history in mind, let's begin. First, uh, Lisa Oldones, the Dean of the Radius School of Management at University of California, San Diego, will give a welcome remark. Lisa. Thank you, Shen. So as many of you know, the Radius School of Management at UC San Diego is a professional school within one of the top ranked research institutions in the US. Being at the nexus of research, development, and innovation, we were fortunate to yield a culturally diverse international student body. Rady develops ethical and entrepreneurial leaders who make a positive impact in the world through innovation, collaboration, and knowledge, all important elements as you will see highlighted in today's presentation. This pandemic has shown the incredible role that supply chain plays in our society and how supply chain crosses each industry. We couldn't be more excited about how supply chain connects not only with our MBA program, but also with our specialty programs, our Masters of Science and Business Analytics, our Master of Finance, and our Masters of Public Accountancy. And further, given the global move toward Mexico and supply chain and our proximity to the Mexican border, we are grateful to have uh, built such a wonderful partnership with speakers and panelists in this event today. With Rady at the helm, these supply chain connections are further furthering the educational and networking opportunities that uh, we provide for our students, both undergraduate and graduate students who are interested in supply chain careers. I'd like to thank our Institute for Supply Chain Excellence and Innovation board members, member, Ranesh um, Mather, who is leading this effort in putting together this webinar together with the ICI team, staff, volunteers, and faculty. Thank you also to our keynote speaker, Emilio Gandena, who has agreed to participate in, in this effort and share many of the ways in which Rady can collaborate with corporate partners and industry leaders in Mexico and beyond. We are finalizing our new Rady strategic plan in which we focus on our strengths and our uniqueness of our location. And thus the bi-national bi region will be an important part of our activities going forward. We'll continue to support trade and supply chains with our Mexican neighbors through programs such as our Border Innovation Challenge in which we encourage solutions to improve the travel and trade between our two nations at our San Diego Tijuana border. We take great pride in educating the future leaders in supply chain and are excited to collaborate with uh, wonderful partners uh, as in today's presentation. So with that, let me turn it back to you and say thank you for, for all that you're doing here and, and enjoy the presentation. Thank you very much, Lisa. It was a great speech. Now uh, let's move on. Uh, Jimmy Encalceria, who is actually a founding chair of the Institute for Supply Chain Excellence and Innovation. Also, um, he's a CEO and founder of the Encalceria Group, which was founded in 1989. So over 30 years, Jimmy. <laughs> 
And with that, and Calceria Group, um, he advised many numerous Fortune 500 companies, resulting in cost savings of several billions of dollars. He's also a mentor of several chief procurement officers and others in the profession. And he's also a big supporter of our Rady School uh, from the beginning. And with that, uh, Jimmy. Thank you, Shin, and uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, I wish I could speak uh, more than one language. Uh, in, of course, whenever I go to uh, Mexico and um, address uh, companies out there, my wife, who is fluent in Spanish, as Lisa knows, uh, you know, would tell me, just say to everyone, you know, como estas, and, you know, bien, and then make sure you say, ojalá que pudiera hablar español, but uh, I don't speak anything more than that. So thank you for having an opportunity to address this group. Uh, in the few minutes that I have, I want to share with you a story. I'm a storyteller, and what I've learned in the many years that's produced this color hair is that good leaders are students of history. So I want to give you a history lesson. That's all I have as I look in my rear view mirror of uh, 35 plus years in this profession. So I want to tell you a story. And in that, I want to weave in uh, two or three themes, which uh, I'll let kind of lay out for you. The first one, of course, being why supply chain? What's so important? What's so strategic about it? Is it called supply chain, procurement, purchasing, you name it, value chain? The second thing I want to address in this uh, in the few minutes that I have with you is uh, the value of relationships and uh, sharing my own history of how I got to meet and know and learn and share learnings with some of the greatest minds and thought leaders in this field. And last of all, uh, a little pitch for the Rady School of Management and the ISEI, but more importantly, to show the value that all of us can bring together. So uh, with that, you know, let's, let's take you back in history, a little memory lane for me. Um, as you can hear from my accent, I didn't grow up in the United States. I actually grew up in India and uh, with an education that was far more on the British side. Uh, I came to America in 1983 uh, with a lot of stars on my shoulder. Uh, I was in my late 20s and I was a chartered accountant, which was a CPA. I had a law degree and... Um, uh, I had a few years working in a conglomerate run by my family. I didn't know what a supply chain was, except that we owned it all uh, in our business, which uh, was liquor. And of course, I've not drunk a drop of liquor in my life, but uh, made a lot of money out of it, my family, that is. And um, uh, so we owned everything. We owned the distillery. We owned the trucks that took the um, liquor to the factory, uh, to the bottling plant. We made about 750,000 to a million bottles a day. So there was an entire production there. Uh, we owned all the logistics for transporting liquor to the 210 bars in the city of Bangalore in those days. We owned all the 210 bars. We took that money every day and put it in the bank. We owned the bank. And of course, it was a very uh, political uh, environment um, where, unfortunately, a very corrupt government was always in your pocket. And, uh, you know, coming from a community that uh, refused to, uh, to do anything outside uh, the legal way, uh, we couldn't pay bribes, so we owned the largest newspaper in the South. So that was my background. And now here I am, a totally different person. The change took place in November of 1984. I was doing my MBA at the University of San Diego, which we'll call the other university. And um, I met a professor named David Burt, and I dedicate this presentation to him. He was my friend, my mentor, my co-author, my guide, the, the converter. He converted me. And unfortunately, at the age of 89, he succumbed to COVID a few months ago, and um, I want to dedicate this to him. David Burt was the person teaching marketing. And I was in this marketing class, but the professor kept talking about the mirror image of marketing called procurement. And after some time, I was a young guy and I rather uh, outspoken, and I raised my hand. I said, excuse me, Dr. Burt, but forgive me. What is this procurement? You keep talking about procurement, and you keep talking about how strategic it is. I said, excuse me, but, you know, I may be in my late 20s, but I have been on so many boards because I just happen to be the SOB of the company, which, by the way, is the son of the boss, not what you're thinking. And uh, I was kind of being primed to become at some day you know, when my father was gone to be the chairman and CEO and all that good stuff. So I said, I'm on every board. 
I'm on so many nonprofits. Whenever my family donated uh, buildings or scholarships and large amounts, uh, they'd ask to be on the board. And my dad would say, take my son. So um, I was on all these boards. And I said, quite honestly, Dr. Bird, I don't think at any of the board meetings, we have had a presentation from this thing you call procurement. We usually have the R&D type people, manufacturing people, definitely marketing, finance. We never see procurement. I could see how I hurt his feelings. And he asked me to come to his office, which I did. And he made a little you know, note for me. And he said, take this pen and write on the board. So I said, oh my gosh, he's giving me a quiz already. So he said, write on the board, Jimmy, you're an accountant. What are the five cost elements that make up the total revenue of a company? I said, what a silly joke for a CPA, right? So I said, direct material, direct labor, manufacturing overhead, general selling, administrative overhead, and profit, 100%, perfect. He said, okay, take the pen. Next to this, choose any of your companies, a typical manufacturing setup. Just write down, arbitrarily, just write down what percentage will each of these cost elements represent? Ah, this is an easy joke again. So I wrote down material 60%, labor 5%, manufacturing overhead is about 300% of labor. So I said, you know, 15, that makes it 80, cost of goods sold. GSNA 15, profit five. Ah, what an easy exam this is. He gave me another pen. I'm like, come on, guys, this is like kindergarten now. He said, next to what you've written, write down how much of this 100% is spent on third parties. So I said, well, all the raw material, that's 60. Direct labor is internal. Manufacturing overhead, which is equipment. So the depreciation of the equipment I'm going to put as third party. Maintenance, security, cafeterias, all outsourced. OK, I said half of it. So that would be about eight. And uh, in the GSNA, yes, we've got outsourced advertising, marketing, et cetera. So I put two and the total came to 70. He didn't need to give me another pen. He just looked at me and he said, so? And I got it. It was the enlightening moment in my life, November of 1984, when I realized how could we be so stupid as a C-level, as a so-called son of the boss, future chairman, future CEO, chartered accountant, lawyer with an MBA, and I could not see in front of me, 70% of our revenue was being put in the hands of these guys called procurement, supply chain, purchasing, you name it. And we didn't care about them. We didn't think they were strategic. They just had to do three bids, take the lowest and move on. What an opportunity. So I didn't look at it as a problem. I looked at it as an opportunity. And I said, Dr. Burt, you have opened my eyes. I think with my background, with my accounting background, finance background, entrepreneurship, I can help you. You are the theorist. So we began writing a book called Zero Based Pricing in 1986 now. Uh, I published some papers and it was selected in the very first, uh, uh, in those days, the ISM was called the NAPM. And the very first NAPM, National Association of Purchasing Managers Research Symposium, featured an article that I wrote. So at that stage, I realized Supply chain is critical. Thinking as an entrepreneur, not as a procurement person, the first thing I did was I called my father and said, I have found nirvana. This is it. We are now going to give up the liquor business and we're going to make 10 times more money. How? By buying companies with, a, say, 10x, uh, uh, you know, 10 times or 50, 20 times uh, EPS, earnings per share. So take a company of 100 million that's making 5 million profit. Let's buy them for 100 million. Let's invest in good procurement and supply chain strategy. And if we can take 10% out of the third party spend, 70%. So 10% of 70% is seven. And if I add seven to the bottom line, plus five, we have increased our profit 140%. How about that pop? And I said, we can flip the company in a couple of years, make a couple of hundred million dollars, give me 10% of that, I can retire. So, you know, and of course he said, Jimmy, you're going to a Catholic university. You should not be doing drugs, my son, go back and study. So that was the end of my dream, but my dream continued. And here we are today, fulfilling a lot of my dream. The dream was, let's take this opportunity and let's bring it to the forefront. Let's 
teach people the importance of supply chain, the importance of procurement. Let's provide them with tools, everything from strategic sourcing, negotiation. Let's teach them logistics. Let's teach them operations. Let's teach them supply chain cost management, which became my baby. And let's teach people. So I started teaching at the university, much against my family's uh, wishes. They were like, come on, why don't you just give a million dollar gift and come home? And I said, no, I'm going to give a billion dollar gift. I'm going to give my life, okay? So I started working with this and uh, the rest as they say is history. During this time, after writing a couple of books, after teaching this to students at the university and then teaching it to companies around the world, I've had the unbelievable three and a half decades of meeting some of the best people, some of whom are on the call today. I met a, another mentor of mine, uh, Gene Richter, who was the head of Hewlett Packard. We made this the, the inherent knowledge of this group. And through that, I met a lot of people. We went on to um, uh, do this great work around at IBM and other places. And today, as I reach the evening of my life, I look back and say, what can I do with this knowledge, with this experience, and most of all, with this unbelievable network and relationship that I've developed over 35 years. And so in 2016, I celebrated a certain decade, and you can guess which one it was. And I determined, I said, you know, I've got to spend the rest of my life and my rest of my career now passing it down to others. And we formed this thing called the ISEI, Institute for Supply Excellence and Innovation. Um, you know, we were honored, my wife and I, to fund part of it. And today I am so thrilled, so honored to have people uh, running the show like Helen Wang, whom you may hear in a little while maybe, but with the help of Helen and Bob Nash, who was our chair last year, and with Dr. Shin and others, and with all your help, we can make this an unbelievable opportunity becoming a reality. So ISEI has grown. I'm so proud of it. I'm so glad to see this opportunity across the border. Uh, this is the ultimate in resilience, my friends. We have learned the sad and hard way what COVID has done. But it's not just COVID. You can go to the semiconductor industry, the electronics industry. History repeats itself. And that's why good leaders are students of history. So I urge you, take advantage of ISCI, take advantage of RADI, take advantage of the University of California, San Diego. Take advantage of us practitioners, take advantage of students. When I say take advantage, I mean use the resource, don't misuse. You know, that's all I tell people. Relationships and networks are about people. Use people. Yesterday I spoke with my son, who's trying to start a production company, he's doing pretty well. And he was asking me, you know, can you contact some of your friends who are looking for making short little, you know, videos, etc." And I said, son, that is important. You need to use the network, but don't ever misuse the network. So I leave it to you and I wish you well for the rest of this program. There is unbelievable talent. You're going to hear unbelievable experiences. And most of those experiences come from the history of the wonderful people who are presenting to you. So let's move forward with the mission that I've always believed in. And I'll leave you with these words. When you, when you think of supply chain, don't think of it as just companies. Think of it as people. Think of it as intellectual capital. And the mission in my own company, my personal passion is the following. Our job in the supply chain world is to harness the inherent knowledge of the extended enterprise. What an opportunity. There is such knowledge. There is such experience. All we have to do is to harness it, bring it together. So come together, enjoy the program, and thank you so much for the opportunity to talk to you. And with that, I'll turn it back to Shin. Thank you, everyone. Great, great. Thank you so much, Jimmy. You are always on time, every time. <laughs> uh, with that, uh, let me actually give you a little bit of an overview on what will happen next. Uh, we will first hear from, <clears throat> sorry, We'll first hear from a, um, uh, some EDCs in the border area, in, including uh, Tijuana EDC, 
and we and we will learn about uh, Baja business opportunities. Okay, and after that we will have industry panel moderated by Bob Meshmater, and in that industry panel we will hear about companies and capabilities in Mexico, and after that we will have a featured speaker Emilio Cadena, who is a president and CEO of Grupo and uh, Prodensa. And if you have any questions, please uh, use Q and A button uh, to to uh, raise your questions. Okay. With that, let's move on. Uh, our next will be Baja Business Opportunities presented by um, EDCs, starting from uh, Carlos Jaramillo, who is the president of Tijuana EDC. Carlos is also a CEO and partner at uh, Via Capital. And Carlos, again, sorry that we missed the big celebration uh, on last Friday. <laughs> Congratulations again. Uh, now officially the current president of the board at Tijuana Economic Development Corporation. Carlos is also a native from Tijuana with a dual degree in business administration from San Diego State University and Satis University. He has over 20 years of experience in industrial real estate development, international business development and foreign direct investment attraction strategies also in sustainable construction, as well as industrial development. Uh, with that, Carlos. Thank you, very, thank you very much, Dr. Shin. Uh, first of all, good morning to all. And I would like to thank Dr. Shin, uh, Lisa Ordonez, Monica Sillas, and Bagnesh uh, for the invitation and for the constant communication we're having between UCSD and the Tijuana ADC in the development of this cross-border strategies that we're currently doing. Uh, today, I'm gonna share my screen. We're gonna talk a little bit about the Tijuana EDC. What are we doing? Uh, some stats about Tijuana, what's going on uh, to give a general overview of the investment environment and the current industrial ecosystem that we have in Tijuana. Uh, the Tijuana EDC, we are the only certified accredited uh, organization in Mexico by the Accredited Economic Development Organization. We're the only one in all Mexico. We've been, uh, we have been 30 years in existence. We have soft landed more than 250 uh, foreign direct investment projects in Tijuana. So we have a long history of helping foreign investors in their endeavor, not only into Tijuana, but to the state of Baja and through all Mexico. Because obviously our objective, uh, first of all, is for companies to look at Mexico, then to the state of Baja, and finally to be located in Tijuana. So overall, we represent Mexico, the state, and the city of Tijuana. Uh, what we do in the Tijuana EDC, basically we work with companies that are interested in setting up or doing business in Mexico, not only, in, not only as foreign direct investment, but also companies who want to expand their sales or companies who want to establish a contracting agreement into Mexico, or just want to know more information, what are we doing in the industrial environment? We have more than 100 members. We are a private entity in, in, in Tijuana where we are supported by different companies similar to the EDCs in the US side, such as the San Diego EDC. We are, we are the counterpart of the San Diego EDC. And we're catering to investors that want and have interest in investing in Mexico. Uh, basically, we work in providing information related to manufacturing costs, logistics, cross-border integration, supply base, uh, and the overall industrial support ecosystem that we have in the market. So again, who, uh, whatever company wants to have information, we're focused in supporting and providing as much as information as possible for them to, to, to make a decision in their endeavor into Mexico and in Tijuana. Now, to give you an overall insight of uh, the maquiladora environment in, 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 in Mexico, uh, which is the foreign investment, uh, now are called uh, EMEX. Uh, the maquiladora uh, regime changed to the EMEX program. And overall in Mexico in November 2020, we had 6,426 6, total foreign companies who were in the export market. 
the northern part, we are dividing the country basically in four areas, north, the, which is the border region, the west, the central Bajillo zone, and the southeast of Mexico. And you can see the colors there, the blues, the greens, the yellows, and the pinks. The border area represents 50.59% of the overall EMEX, EMEX manufacturing companies, uh, which are 3,751. Uh, Tijuana, from that northern part, Tijuana has 900 of them. Uh, we are uh, right now with that, with those 900, we are for the, we have a market of 14% of the overall uh, companies within Mexico. So Tijuana has a big part of this, 14% of the overall uh, industry in Mexico. Then we have the West, uh, where is basically Aguascalientes, Colima, Durango, Jalisco, and Michoacán, which is 10.29% with 661 companies. Then we have the central part of Mexico uh, with 21.79%, and then the Southeast, which has 1.70% of the overall industry. Totally, we are employing 3 million people in these industries, where in Baja California, we have 400,000 people being employed. Uh, from the overall industries that we have in the state of Baja, 70% of them are located in Tijuana. So that gives you an overview of the, of the full uh, industrial export environment that we have in the country. Uh, some quick facts about Tijuana. Uh, we are currently uh, registering around $1 billion of FDI every year generating around 20,000 new jobs in the market. We have a population of 1.9 million based on the last census. And we're still growing at a rate of 5% per year. That growth rate is half social growth rate, people that are migrating to Tijuana uh, to find jobs. And the other half of that growth rate is due to natural growth. Uh, we have a big, and we're going to talk a little bit uh, after about the industries that we have within Tijuana. By 90% of the medical device companies are certified uh, based on US standards, FDI, ISOs, and other standards. Uh, we're the largest uh, exporter for flat screen televisions of America. We are manufacturing around 30 million sets uh, per year. Uh, we are the number one city uh, with companies in the export uh, industry. We're the number one medical device cluster in North America. We're the number two in electronics, number four in automotive, one in, in aerospace, and we're developing the new clusters, which is going to go into biotech and IT, which are clusters that are under development. Uh, we have more than 35 universities and nine academic institutions with cross-border agreements, which is a big benefit. Uh, why Tijuana grew as it, it has grown. A lot has to do with this cross-border, bi-national, bi-cultural relationship that we have with the U.S. and specifically with San Diego. We are, if, if you see the whole border in all the, all the border cities, this is the only border where the U.S. city is larger than the Mexican city. If we go to Mexicali, Calexico is smaller than Mexicali. We go to Juarez. El Paso is smaller than Juarez. So the dynamics of San Diego and Tijuana are totally different. And that has a lot to do with why Tijuana has grown so much and the connectivity that we have with San Diego, with California, with the US, and makes the demographics totally different. Uh, this is what we're talking about, Cali Baja, which is this region, this bicultural bi uh Binational region, which we consider uh, one. Uh, basically, we're, we, we have around 27 million residents uh, living in this area, which is comprised from San Diego, the Imperial County, and the state of Baja California. We have more than 90 universities, 80, 80 plus RD centers, uh, 35 investment funds, and more than 630 companies are related to contract manufacturing. 
So we have a big uh, support system in this Calibaja region, which is unique. We cannot compare, and this is a very unique region. Nothing is the same, nothing compares to this in the whole world. And this is so unique and part of the reason why we have grown as much as what we're seeing right now. Now, as I mentioned, uh, we have more than 900 companies that are operating in Tijuana. Uh, and which are the main industrial sectors? Electronics, as I mentioned. On my presentation, you're gonna see some of the most representative companies that are participating in such sector. In electronics, we have around 65,000 employees with more than 100, 150 of them in the market. Then we go to medical devices where we have more than 50,000 employees in that sector, more than 50 companies and being the number one cluster in North America uh, in Tijuana. Then we go to automotive, uh, 30,000 employees with 80 companies in the automotive industry. Then in, in aerospace and defense, around 30,000, 13,000 employees uh, plus 45 companies. An important part of this is what's next. And what's next is a convergence of industries. We can now think about automotive being more into the electronics than in reality automotive. Then we have medical devices that have display devices, medical devices that are into electronics. So we are in a big convergence of industries in the market. So that's a big factor, an important factor of what's going on in Tijuana today, where the lines are becoming more transparent and a big convergence within the industries in becoming one, because they're sharing displays, they're sharing electronics, they're sharing plastics, they're sharing knowledge. Uh, there's a lot of IT going in into the product. And that takes me to my, my, my next slide. Let me go back. So this slide, which is uh, education. What are we doing in education and what support are we giving to this industry? We have more than 35 public and between public and private universities with 14,000 students enrolled in engineering and technical programs. We are big in engineering. We're working a lot with the companies uh, to get students uh, connected to the industry we have five main institutions that are basically focused in, in generating technical capacities and engineering capacities for the industry that we have in the market. And a big part of this also is all the cross-border knowledge that we have between institutions. Uh, most of the San Diego-based institutions have cross-border agreements with the Tijuana-based uh, universities. And this is a big item where we're transferring knowledge from the U.S. to Mexico and from Mexico to the U.S. and creating this innovation hub. Main reason why we're talking about now of the supporting industries that we are creating. Um, this value added uh, graph obviously is not only a matter of production, it's a matter of logistics, it's a matter of design, R&D, marketing and services. And we are creating today in Tijuana this support base for the manufacturing, for the manufacturing uh, companies. One, we have a whole network of contract manufacturers, which we have more than 160 companies going from assembly, metal mechanics, plastic injection, prototyping, microelectronics, generating molds. So we have this base for prototyping, an important part of the industry. Second, the IT and software development industry. We have more than 150 companies working in software development, doing applications within the industry and also applications for the products that we're seeing today in the market. Contact centers and business processing outsourcing. We have around 8,000 employees there with more than 60 companies operating in this. And then KPOs and, and excellence centers with more than 3,000 employees. So it's not only a matter of manufacturing, it's what support industries are we creating uh, to create more value into the product. Software today is becoming much more important within the industry. 
Next, um, we will have a presentation from the Mexicali EDC. Uh, Rudolfo Andrade will present uh, Mexicali EDC's perspective. Rudolfo is the current president of the board at the Mexicali Economic Development Corporation. And also he's the founder of the CETIS University and the University of Oklahoma Economic Development Institute. And he has served as assistant dean there. And he's also the author of a Imprenende in Mexico methodology and book uh, that adapts lean startups for the Mexican and Latin countries. He also had a 28 years of actively participating in international marketing and economic development activities. He was involved in projects where over $1.5 billion worth of, of the money have been invested in Mexico. And his last projects have been related to resilience and economic reactivation in communities that have suffered economic downturns. Okay. With that, uh, Rudy will present uh, Mexicali EDC's perspective. In particular, some questions that we had was, uh, what is the role of the EDC? And when would someone that wants to do business in Mexico call uh, the EDC? And what type of manufacturing capabilities are strong in Mexico as well as in, ED, uh, in Mexicali, right? With that, uh, Rudy. Uh, hi, how are you, everybody? It's a pleasure to be with all of you. Uh, Carlos, nice to see you. Uh, and, and all the team from, from UCSD, it's a pleasure. We've been talking and we've been working very hard. I know that great things will, will come out uh, of, of this specific center, which, which I think it's very pertinent to what we're doing. Um, well, first of all, uh, give a little bit of, of history and background from uh, the Mexicali EDC perspective. Mexicali is the capital of the state of Baja. Uh, the EDC in itself, it has over 44 years of existence, and it was created as basically a clearinghouse for questions, a, a very specific and very straightforward organization to help investors establish in the city of Mexicali. If you can do some history before, I mean, some, tell you a little bit of, of the background is that, uh, as you well know, in Mexico, we used to have in some states and a, a famous no problema syndrome. You know, somebody would come in and you want to start something and everybody says, oh, no problema, no problema. And, and no problema sometimes means a big problem <laughs> because we are, we are a different country. Uh, even though we're bordering the, with the states, uh, I mean, we, we have uh, different ways of doing things. Uh, I think that that uh, the linkage between California and Baja California is, is so strong that we understand a lot from each other, but other parts of the states, other parts of the world, when they come into Mexico, even though we're next to the states, it's a different legislation, different things, of, different ways of doing things. So the EDC at that time in the 70, 1977, uh, when it started, uh, we really uh, were in the stage of when the first maquiladora program started, they started in the late 60s and really flourished in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Uh, but at that time, it, it was uh, an adventure for a company, a foreign company, to come into Mexico. The, the Mexican legislation was not really prepared. So uh, we took it to ourselves as a community to uh, have this specific organization created by people and professionals that knew how to uh, uh, give insurance as well as generate trust for the foreign investors so that they could land safely in our city. So that's the origin of the EDC and it has grown. And we are very much a, a, a very well established uh, organization. The board is a, is a private board, uh, which is made up of mostly uh, businessmen that are related in some way, either to attracting foreign investment servicing foreign investment or supplying foreign investment in the city of, of Mexicali. In this case, in the, a little bit of a difference between Carlos organization and ours is that uh, EDC in Mexicali was born as a small part of the Mexicali government. So we do carry representation of the city government uh, and that has uh, helped in, in some ways the, the way to link the city government uh, to the foreign investment. So that's, that's a particular small difference. Besides that, we do very, very similar work. Uh, I, I, sometimes I would like not to have some of the bureaucratic <laughs> deals of being part of the government, 
but that's part of the deal, but it's managed more on the private side than in the public side. So we, we are a, a basically a private functioning organization at the city of Mexicali. Um, nonprofit, of course, and as I mentioned, uh, attracting and growing industrial investment in town. Uh, what do we do and how do we support companies? Well, the, the main thing is that when a, when a company comes into Mexico, you have to be, uh, you cannot oversell because you have to be very honest. And, and the, the, the more honesty you, you, you uh, the more trust you gain. So if uh, something is $10, it's $10, it's not seven or 12. So you have to be very straightforward, especially because investors, uh, if I'm investing in the States as I have before, I have to hear it as it is because I have to plan. And I so we, we generate business seminars with professionals that are part of the membership of the Mexicali EDC. And not everybody can be a member of the EDC, same as in Tijuana. Not everybody that, that you know, wants to join can join. You have to have very specific credentials. Uh, obviously, we would guide companies in what they are looking for in the city and what they're looking for in Mexico. Uh, in a sense, the, the Mexical, the ED or foreign attraction part of the EDC uh, really uh, and needs to understand what stage of the investment this company is in. If it's in the first stage where they're not really, they, they don't really know where to go. If it's Mexico, if it's China, if it's another country, then the second stage of if it's Mexico, where in Mexico and why in Mexico. And the third stage when then they decide or they narrow down their list to two or three cities or regions. Uh, we, we can work with them from the first to the third stage up to the fourth stage when they select Mexicali and their landing and we help them generate that specific soft landing and, and serve as a government liaison for the specific companies that are uh, landing in our region. Our manufacturing capabilities. Uh, well, as some of them we share with Tijuana because we are basically very, very close by. And uh, aerospace is, is strong in Mexicali, medical devices, obviously electronics. And, and we've had cycles during the last 40 years of existence. When we started as EDC 40 something years ago, is more, it was more textile. And, and now it's uh, more aerospace, medical devices, electronics that are not only for consumer electronics, but also for aerospace and automotive, uh, food and beverage. We have a very extended uh, agricultural valley. So we do have uh, produce being transformed in our region. So that's a very important part of, of Mexicali. Automotive, well, we have uh, the, the a big plant, which is uh, Kenworth, which uh, basically started in the 50s here in town. Uh, plastics also for the different uh, uh, industries that we have. And obviously logistics, which has grown quite a bit in the last year and a half or two years, uh, same as all the border cities. Uh, just a quick fact, Mexicali, you may, uh, uh, it's a city of around a million people. Uh, Incredibly enough, in 1980, Mexicali was was had a, a larger population than Tijuana. So you you can see the expansion that the region has had in, in a very short time. Um, we also uh, have a very strong manufacturing capabilities. Obviously, assembly, MRO, and design. And I want to emphasize design because of, uh, we aspire to grow in the value chain. And we have been working with institutions, not only to generate uh, the assembly part, which you know, we've been doing for over 50, 40 years or so, but also on the design side. Design is strong in Mexicali. All the schools have had uh, the curricular enhanced on the design part. So we do have not only manufacturing design, but also software design. So it's something that, that we're very proud of and we, we will be promoting it more and more. Uh, uh, reverse engineering, 
close to a little bit together with design, but it's been very interesting the last couple of years when the near nearshoring is quite popular. We have had uh, companies that had um, all their manufacturing in China look for returning to to North America, and sometimes uh, generating. Uh, or getting back the designs or getting back the molds or getting back certain parts of the integrated uh, uh, production uh, has been a little bit difficult. So we have been working on reverse engineering to restart and generate new designs, new drawings, uh, new molds and so. So it, it's something that's been very, very uh, strongly uh, developed in the last couple of years. Uh, obviously, software development, value added, 3D modeling, prototyping, IoT integration, and obviously social, social media marketing. So that specific area of, of a larger value is what we aim to, uh, is what we're looking for. Uh, besides the traditional manufacturing, you have to, in this new world, have to complement each other. You cannot grow if you don't have the specific areas to grow. So, uh, and also we understand that we have to have the right type of personnel developed in our region. So it's something that, that, that you cannot do one without the other. Um, so that, that's very important for us, especially being neighbors with uh, California. Um, metal mechanic, Mexicali, you know, has been um, organically growing into, and now, is a very established metal mechanic center. Um, it started quite a while ago with agricultural implements. Then the Kenworth truck company came in and it was first, as you, some of you may know, it was not an American company. I mean, they sold, they, they, they sold their product to Packer, but until the 90s, it was still a Mexican entity that was selling full built trucks to to the US uh, company. And, and that developed a very strong metal shop integration for that specific automotive product. And now, and, and, and that base gave us opportunity to have people that were trained since the 80s and 90s, and then started bringing in uh, aerospace and metal mechanic uh, uh, engineering for engines, as you see there, uh, GK and aerospace started doing pieces, very important pieces for, for airplane engines here. Cheap metal fabrication. I mean, a, a wide variety of, of um, related metal mechanic uh, capabilities. We, we do have quite a bit of, of universities. Um, the SETI system started in Mexicali, and then grew to Tijuana and Ensenada. And it's a very strong system that works a lot with linkages. And it's a very, very, one of the uh, 10 best private universities in Mexico. Uh, we also have very strong state universities as well as technical institutes in town. Uh, and we're very proud of, of, of having a lot of engineers graduating. Uh, the, the role of the EDC in this is extremely important. Uh, I remember in 1990s, we, we sat down with the state university president. There was no industrial engineering in, in the state university at that time. So the EDC served as a, uh, as a information hub for the university so they could plan ahead and, and start designing the specific engineering uh, 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 careers that were needed at that specific time. Because as you well know, you need at least four, five, six years to develop a new program. And, and that's very important to, to do that and link with the specific universities that have and, and, and render information to them so they can plan ahead. Um, <clears throat> Obviously, we have vocational schools, technical schools, and in the uh, specific foreign uh, maquiladora industry, there's around 80,000 employees. Obviously, there's a lot more in, in, in the whole city, but specifically in there. Um, so this is our, our, our new, actually, you're seeing the new logo, the Mexicali DC logo, and their new slogan, where smart companies go to get things done. So thank you very mm -hmm. much. Great. Thank you very much, Rudy. It's, it, it is really interesting to hear even the cultural aspect of 
you know, uh, sometimes no problemo doesn't mean it's not a problem. Right? It can be a big problem. Also, uh, it's it's all. I'm delighted to hear that you know even in the smile curve, uh, Tijuana in Mexicali region is going up the up the value chain, even, including the design aspect of it. Right. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank Great. you. And thank you. Uh, uh, any questions you may have, be more than glad. <laughs> Great, thank you. Just for the interest of time, uh, we will move on to the panel discussion. It will be moderated by Bhavnesh Martyr. Uh, Bhavnesh is the CEO of Masterwork Electronics in Mexicali, and also he's the former chair of the board of, the board of Directors for the Institute for Supply Chain Excellence and Innovation right here at UC San Diego. Uh, Bhavnesh is a senior executive with over 20 years of experience providing insightful and pragmatic leadership for organizations to achieve their top priority goals. Within a variety of environments, he has consistently paved the way for both immediate and long-term results through expertise, diligence, and passion. With that, Bhavnesh. I have been going to Mexico for probably 35, 40 years, and I've just been very pleased and impressed with the development of Mexico as a country. Um, and then where Mexico is today. Uh, number two, you heard Jimmy speak a little while ago. I think Jimmy and I first met more than 25 years ago. So I represent a lot of what, uh, what he was talking about. And I certainly share his vision of what we're trying to accomplish here at Rady and UCSD. With that, um, we are gonna have four panelists. I would like it very much if they would introduce themselves. So if it's okay, maybe we can start with you, Eduardo, if you're on the Call, just take a couple of minutes to introduce yourself and your company and, and uh, help us learn more about you. First of all, welcome everybody. Thanks a lot for the invitation to, to uh, uh, UCSD, to Grady, to all the organizers of this magnific magnificent event. Thanks a lot. Uh, I'm Eduardo Salcedo. I'm the director of operations for Osher Medical. It's an orthopedics and biorobotics uh, manufacturer leading, leading brand worldwide. And we are located uh, headquarters in Iceland, uh, Reykjavik, in uh, the biggest manufacturing facility. I'm fortunate to be running it here in Tijuana, Mexico for the last uh, five years, but I have like 25 years of experience, mostly on the medical device industry with companies like Baxter Healthcare, Allegiance Healthcare, uh, Pal Medical, you name it. And, and at the very early stage of my career on the electronics, because I'm uh, electronics engineer by trade. But today we're, talk, we're going to talk about the fusion between the electronics and the medical device industry. That uh, it's uh, a very important subject. Excellent, excellent, Eduardo. Thank you very much. Javier, perhaps you could go next and introduce yourself and your company. Thank you, Babnesh. Uh, my name is Javier Valadez. I have more than ten years of experience working for auto industry in Mexico. Uh, I started a few years ago working with Audi when it was just a mild idea in Germany and then I survived because it was a tough process to have all this uh, greenfield implementation in Mexico up until the first uh, SUV came out of the factory and currently I'm working for Kenworth Mexico as uh, Rodolfo was saying it's an American uh, company who manufactures heavy duty trucks and tractors uh, based in Seattle Washington and we have a big manufacturing facility up in Mexicali, Baja California. So um, currently I am heading the free trade agreements, uh, customs and compliance areas for the company. And uh, I'm also part of the Comexi International Relations Think Tank in Mexico City. Thank you for the invitation. Oh, excellent, Javier. Thank you very much for joining us. Felipe, it's good to see you again. Um, perhaps you can introduce yourself. Yeah, uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Felipe Sandoval. I'm the current general manager of the Safran Aerosystems operations in Chihuahua, which are uh, basically five facilities with eight different business units, uh, 3,600 uh, people working in, in those. And, and um, I have been in aerospace industry for 15 years, five with Safran. And 10 years, I was the vice president of the integrated supply chain in Honeywell Aerospace in the mechanical division. And uh, before of that, I worked for automotive. I worked for Toyota, Koito. I spent almost a year in Japan and also worked for Valeo and, and Fiat in the automotive industry. Uh, 
I'm certainly also serving in the Mexican Federation of Aerospace Industry. I was the former president until the end of the last year. And, uh, and looking forward to work with you and to have a good discussion about supply chain opportunities. Thank you. Thank you, Felipe. And Saul, thank you so very much for joining us. We appreciate it. We appreciate your flexibility. Please introduce yourself to us. Thanks, Manesh. Good morning, everyone. Well, I'm Saul de los Santos. Today, I'm representing Canieti, which is the chamber for the electronics, telecom, and IT industries in Mexico. Uh, Roman Caso, our president, couldn't make it today, but um, he asked me to participate. And I think it, this will be a great opportunity to share some of the insights that for about two decades we have um, come up with, with the research activities from my firm access. Nice, great. glad to be here. Well, thank you all very much. I, uh, I have prepared a few questions to ask you and, and, and I prepared these questions with the perspective of businesses trying to get into Mexico. What might a business company um, think about as we think about Mexico. One of the first questions that I have for you, and maybe we'll start um, with you, Eduardo, is how did your company, the bigger company you work with, choose Mexico as a global location? What, where else were they considering and how did Mexico win? Well, it was basically a matter of assessing the capabilities, demonstrated capabilities that the Mexican labor force has done in terms of uh, high-tech uh, manufacturing of complex products. Uh, the geographic advantage that is undeniable a uh, key competitive advantage that we have. Uh, in our case, and maybe this is very specific to our business, the orthopedic global market divides worldwide like 50% the U.S. and 50% the rest of the world. We're talking about a market that is, uh, in 2018, it was around $45 billion and the projections that the uh, estimated annual growth, uh, four to 6% will take us to $60 billion by 2025. Uh, so you're next to the biggest market for that segment of, of products that we manufacture. Uh, but again, it's, it's not an easy fit because you have to, to have the conjunction of a capable labor force, a geographic location that is appealing to the biggest market that you have for your product, and then the demonstrated uh, capability of acquiring those type of complex products and complex processes and make them productive and, by the way, without quality disruptions. And I think uh, having the biggest conglomerate nationwide in Mexico, here in Baja, also played a role. So I can go on and on, but you start to see that all the pieces of the puzzle when it comes to medical devices, in particular to orthopedics and capabilities and demonstrated uh, quality track record uh, pointed out to, to Mexico and within Mexico to the Calibaja region. Got it, understand that. And, and Javier, is that the same in, in your business? The US market is big and, and Mexico is compelling place um, to be? I would love to say that we chose Mexico because of its 13 free trade agreements and its geographical location, but not. So uh, we go back all the way to 1950 when uh, there was this small uh, factory that used to make tractors in uh, Mexico at a small scale. And then in one uh, supplier visit from these people from PACAR, our holding from Seattle, Mexicali, and then sometime during the next summer, they realized they had reached out their capacity at their factories in the US. So they recalled that they met some guy in Mexicali who made these uh, trucks in the country. So they said, oh no, you know, we have an, a, an order to fill with 23 different tractors that we have to ship to Peru. So how about you make it? We know you have some quality. We'll provide some input, some know-how, and uh, that's how it all started. It, it was a, a 23 export shipment from Mexicali to Peru, and then it all began, and now we have more than 3,500 employees up in Mexicali. That's excellent. Great, great, great. Felipe, how did, uh, how did the aerospace industry end up so big in, in Mexico? What the, Did you have global competition or... Yes, basically the aerospace industry is a global industry, same and automotive. Uh, there are some differences. You know, I basically spent 15 years, initial one, uh, 
the aerospace industry is much more product oriented and is much more restrictive. Uh, and an, aero, an automotive is much more open and competitive and, and certainly much higher speed, let's say, in all, in all the different areas. Uh, in aerospace, because I, I have the fortune to start the, the Honeywell, which have a, a, a big facility in Mexicali and a big uh, lab uh, for electromechanical uh, testing in Mexicali, uh, the, the aerospace started uh, founding over the automotive industry foundations. Mm -hmm. When aerospace started about 15 years ago in Mexico, it's very recent uh, uh, industry. Uh, in reality, was building up on the foundations of automotive. Uh, the requirements are very similar. The supply chain, a lot of the supply chain is also similar. Of course, the speed and the volumes and the economies of scales are completely different, but the technical uh, competencies or skills are very similar. Yeah. The, the reality was more an opportunity uh, because aerospace uh, began to have a similar uh, pressures of competitiveness than the automotive. And, and certainly Mexico is the cost competitive country in North American region. Right. So right. aerospace just follow a uh, receipt <laughs> developed by the automotive industry 50 years ago or 60 years ago and follow the, the same path basically, but in much more accelerated uh, rhythm. For example, in automotive takes uh, about 40 years, 50 years for automotive to jump from manufacturing to design. In aerospace, we started simultaneously. You know, all the big groups, you know, GE, Honeywell, Collins, Safran, started big R&D centers in Mexico since 10 years ago. So started almost simultaneously the R&D area uh, together with the, uh, the supply chain of manufacturing. Where is a huge opportunity yet in the aerospace industry, the supply chain development. We still are uh, with a very, very small uh, content of American, uh, of Mexican supply chain. Right, right. Very, very interesting. Very, very helpful. Thank you for sharing that. Saul, how do you, how do you explain the competitiveness of Mexico against other places? What, what strikes strong in Mexico? Well, there are several issues, and we have to talk um, perhaps more specifically in the border region, northern border region, as having um, these characteristics of faster access to the market, and then also the cultural and language proximity with the U.S. So those uh, elements factor in after what Javier has also mentioned before regarding the free trade agreements which gave Mexico this opportunity to be a, a very open uh, platform for international activities and integrating a supply chain that for all of the companies from the sectors that we have, that we have talked about so far are sourcing from Asia, from North America, from Europe and so forth. So in that sense, um, I think that the other aspect that throughout actually decades has been built up is the capability of management to handle a very complex, very global um, so extended supply chain, not only in terms of sourcing parts, components, materials, but also in delivering. So uh, as time has progressed, our capability to uh, deliver in time, in form, quality, quantity to any place in the world, it's, it's also a capability we, we usually don't consider because it's, it's, it's uh, not in, in, in what we could consider the, the, the back end of the supply chain. So on the front end, we also have to consider those capabilities. And also uh, engineering, as time has progressed, engineering capabilities, I, I would say there's still a, a wide area of opportunity for design and R&D. I mean, for most of the companies, that is not the case, it's usually uh, more focused on the mid and large scale firms. 
But in terms of industrial engineering process capabilities, technification, we're, we're seeing a, a huge trend in, in automation efforts throughout the industry. So we have to take that into account. And then, then if we look into central Mexico as another uh, pole or, or concentration of industry in Guanajuato and other regions, they have also been successful because of their technical capabilities around metal mechanics and, and manufacturing and so forth. And they also have uh, about the same advantages in terms of cost competitiveness. So if, if we can wrap this together with the institutions and with public policies, then I, I think we, we could have even, even a better, better scenario for the future. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good point. And it's sort of the, the next topic. It's a, it's a question that comes up very often. When we look at the U.S., there are so many good education institutions and, and universities, and you can go hire a supply chain person, an engineering person from different places. In India, you know, we hear about IT and engineers coming out of India. Um, when it comes to technical skills and leadership skills, as Mexico grows, uh, maybe we start with you, uh, uh, Saul, because you just kind of finished up here. Where will the future people come from? Where will the future engineers and programmers come from and where will the future CEOs come from in Mexico? Yes, well, um, I think we have to put into the equation what the pandemic has put onto the table. I think the, the labor market will become um, quite global. So in that sense, um, we can have both management and, and engineering talent um, serving worldwide. So that's our advantage is the possibility to expand the possibilities of Felipe, Eduardo, Javier, and many other talented people of handling operations in, in a more international sense. So where will it come from? I think it's a mix. Um, usually the private institutions in Mexico are better. I, I mean, we've talked about safety, Tec Tec de Monterrey and other institutions at preparing people that can um, not in all cases, but in many instances, uh, go to higher management in a much faster pace because they're more business oriented in the way that they were, they were uh, prepared. And then we have um, very strong national public institutions such as Politecnico and the state universities, which have a, a very good grasp on the technical fields of engineering. So I think we have uh, this mix of both the technical and managerial soft skills being built up in, in order to serve this. And also the other, the other area, I think it's uh, participation in, in clusters, chambers, associations, and so <clears> forth, <throat> also help build the uh, capabilities for leadership. So in the abundance of these types of institutions in Baja California has brought a lot of people that perhaps were quite good in a technical sense, but put them into the daylight and so can, we can share and, and perhaps learn from one another. Yeah, great. Javier, same question to you in a way, when, when you are looking for top leaders, where, where are you finding them? So I would say everywhere, um, but mostly um, I think we found a lot of talented people here in Mexico. Uh, and this is because, uh, for example, in the northern part of the region, as Carlos and Rodolfo were mentioning, we've seen this subculture where speaking English is just as natural as speaking Spanish. It's just an everyday routine. So this uh, has a lot of impact for American companies or foreign companies that come to Mexico as they are able communicate in a constant way with American, French, Indian, Chinese uh, colleagues from all around the world. So I would say Mexico. What I've seen in my experience is normally when companies come as greenfield projects, they do bring some expats as part of their onboarding process because something that is key for success for international companies that come to Mexico is learning about the uh, local culture and for Mexicans to learn about corporate culture. So there needs to be this uh, merging between these cultures and then help to create a new one as a whole. So I would say uh, Mexico and of course, maybe within the first couple of years, maybe three years, there has to be an important blend of leadership coming from 
whatever the company's coming from. Got it. And, 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 and Eduardo, a similar question for you. Your, your situation seems even more difficult to me because we were talking about knowledge and leadership, but as well as medical technology, which you know, is big in right. Mexico, but not as big as probably the other, the other we have talked about. Right, right. Definitely, we can take the OSER case as a microcosm. Uh, we're talking about the high-end uh, manufacturing technology. We're talking about seven-axis CNC machines, pieces of equipment that are not the most advanced in Mexico, but the most advanced in uh, worldwide located in a Mexican facility in Tijuana. And I'm always take a lot of pride when, when I can say that each one of those pieces of equipment is run by a Tijuana native. Uh, again, taking the, the Osur case, we're talking about 800 people working here in this facility that is a highly automated facility. So although 800 people doesn't sound like a huge number, uh, when you consider the type of manufacturing that we do is equivalent to having a 3,000, 5,000 people uh, facility. Uh, and all of these automated processes and equipments, not a single one, and this is an important statement, not one out of the 800 people, it's uh, an outsider, it's not a Mexican citizen. So when we talk about, uh, we gotta be careful, when we talk about the capability to lead remotely because of the technology and the availability of that, cap that resource, uh, capability doesn't mean that is the preferred or the most efficient method. In uh, supply chain, that is what uh, it's, uh, we're talking about here, we have a say in that point of use availability is the most critical thing or the most desirable thing. So uh, Mexico has a particular opportunity if you marry those two concepts. If you have the technical, high technical leadership capable of being developed here in Mexico, at the same time that you have the manufacturing power here, then the point of use availability of highly technological leadership becomes like the preferred method of operating. Although you can manage it from the Czech Republic via remotely, uh, it's not the same as having the know-how yeah of a technical expert where your manufacturing processes are. Just my two cents. That makes sense. And then Felipe, a similar question for you. You manage so many people. When you look at the supply chain of talent, someone that is starting college and they are working for you, how does it feel to you? Does it look like a, a strong supply chain? Do you have more people, not enough people? Well, let, let me tell you a, a big difference between US and Mexico. In, in how to address the supply chain. In the, in the most important industries, I'm talking automotive, aerospace, appliances, most of our engineers, I would say about 85% are coming from the national uh, regional technological is, is schools, which are public. Uh, even myself, I graduated from the Torreon Technological uh, Institute, uh, Laguna uh, Tech. So about 80, 85, 90% of uh, engineers, which is basically the main, the main kind of uh, professions that are picking up by, by all the global companies in those industries are coming from, that, from those schools. Also, we have a very solid uh, private school uh, network. Uh, uh, schools like the Monterey Tech, as one mentioned, um, the CETIS in the Baja area, etc., are, are providing, besides, of course, the regular bachelor and master degrees, they are also providing specialized courses for supply chain certifications, uh, APICS uh, certifications, things like that. So to be honest with you, most of our resources are coming from a technical institute, graduated from engineering, you know, mechanical, electronic, electric, whatever. And then the people want to start making a career in a company, they start to get a, a specialized, let's say, education. They go get a certification, they go and get a course of Lean and Six Sigma or supply chain management or, you know, something like that. Normally in a private uh, university like Monterey Tech, for example. Yeah. And, and, and that's what usually happen in most of the companies in Mexico. Yeah. Uh, uh, 
the majority are coming from public schools. So uh, above all the technological, the regional technological schools. And then, you know, people used to continue their education, their, their specialized education in, in, in some good private universities like CETIS or Monterey Tech. Uh, that's, that's very, very, uh, very informative. When we talk about University of California, San Diego, UCSD, that's exactly what we do there. People can get a degree in multiple different subjects, like you were saying, engineering and, and even other topics but then get specialization and certificates in certain supply chain areas, or get an MBA degree, which can include all of that, or get an engineering degree, which is even more in supply chain uh, topics as well. So uh, very, very similar in that sense, sense. Thank you very much for doing that. I, I wanna change uh, uh, topics a little bit and I'll start with you, Felipe. And we talked about this a little bit before. One of the things we're finding is that as business is moving fast from China to Mexico, the need for good second tier and third tier suppliers close to where you all are is just growing. People that can take over not only the main work, but the metal, the plastic, the cables, you know, what, what, whatever else. The automotive business and the, uh, the, uh, the avionics business seems to have done a good job with that. But how do you feel about that? And, and, and are second tier and third tier, tier suppliers ready for more business in Mexico in your mind? Yes. Let, let me tell you, there is a, a huge opportunity <laughs> right there in what you are describing. Uh, the, the supply chain in Mexico normally, uh, you know, is much smaller than the, what you find in, in some other countries like China. Uh, for example, you know, you have a good network of good suppliers in different commodities like plastics, machining, metal cheating, stamping, things like that. Uh, but they are uh, they are smaller in 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 size and capabilities if you compare with a similar network in China or US. And that's a natural thing, you know, because the supply chain in Mexico still needs a lot of development. But the technical capabilities are here. O sea, we have a very good suppliers, technically speaking, very competent, very skillful, and they are able to compete. There are two big issues that we have found. One is supply chain, uh, raw material. You know, in other words, in Mexico, you find good uh, tiers two and tiers threes, let's say middle guys, you know, machining, plastics, etc but you don't have a very good, strong supply of raw material. So, you know, probably the machining guy in Mexico is as competitive as the one that you have in China uh, in terms of technical skills and competitiveness, but the raw material availability and cost is a huge difference between Mexico and, and China. Yeah. Uh, and I'm talking almost twice <laughs> the cost yeah. So that's a competitive issue that we all together need to address. So if you are looking for a bar of aluminum 6061 in Mexico, you will find it almost twice as expensive as you find it in China. Okay. Same specs, same technical you know, uh, standards. And that's an issue. That's an issue on competitiveness for the supply chain in Mexico and in North America, I would say at the end of the day, um, because we are integrated in the region. So that's a, that's a problem that, uh, that we are finding. In other words, uh, the supply chain in the middle, especially thanks to the automotive industry, as I said, those are the main, let's say, developers of supply chain in Mexico in the last 50 years, 60 years. Uh, so the middle, the tier one and two suppliers are, are a good, we have a good base, but the, the tier four, o sea, the, the raw material suppliers, we still have a big gap. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and we need to address that. We need to find a way that the North American region have a very good, strong supply of raw material. Got it. Saul, uh, similar thoughts on your part or, or how would you see yeah. second and third tier suppliers in Mexico? 
Sure. Um, this takes me back to a research project we developed for the UN Agency for Regional Development of Latin America a few years ago. And we benchmarked the practices between Asia, certain parts of Europe, and then South America and the Brazilian area. And what we found in, in that sense is that um, usually um, firms that develop capabilities, and the, uh, the most obvious case was in East Europe, um, after building in a developing country, their capabilities, they were bought off by German companies. So um, in that sense, there's a, there's a huge part to the equation in terms of the economies of scale and the capabilities of multinational firms of being able to govern uh, supply chains. So in that sense, um, we usually think that it's feasible for small companies to do that large um, jump into, into um, supplying multinationals. But actually, it's more of a matter of working with the multinationals and then doing a strategy with governments, with incentives, in order to address key areas of the supply chain. Perhaps we're not going to be available, or um, it will be not feasible to be suppliers in every field, whether it be components, metals, plastics, and so forth. But if we select the ones that are strategic to the region, and then we put policy behind that, perhaps we, have, we can have better results. And I think electronics in the past week has proven to be uh, a key area where every, every sector is now involved in semiconductors. I mean, you can always look into replacing a metal part with a reinforced plastics and so forth. But what can you do with a semiconductor? There's no way to go around it. So in that sense, we have to be more strategic in where we're gonna put those expectations for a, a, a more robust uh, supply chain. I, I agree. To me, uh, you know, as I think about Mexico, there are major next steps the country can take. And, and many countries have tried to get into the semiconductor business, India being one of them as an example, uh, Mexico being another, that would be a major step. And I'm sure one that Mexico will get to. Uh, Javier, are you comfortable with your second and third tier suppliers or do you still have um, this? Yeah, I think there could be more, definitely. I definitely agree with what Saul was saying, but I'd like to draw out some numbers. So most of the uh, business environment in Mexico is composed by small and medium enterprises. And this means mostly by more than 90%. They create 78% of the formal employment in Mexico and they contribute to more than 42% of the gross domestic product of the country. So there are capabilities, but what the Mexican uh, government, and, and maybe it is the states that are the ones investing in this, is there has to be some uh, business education within these companies so that they invest on certifications that assure bigger companies, tier twos, tier ones, OEMs, that they can comply with international standards. So I think there is still a gap to go. I think this uh, uh, global perspective is coming down all the way to the tier threes and tier fours, mainly because of its uh, of the regional influence on depending on the region or the sector that you are settled in. So for example, I would say in Baja California, Guanajuato, or perhaps Nuevo Leon, this is more common, but if you go if you go southeast Mexico or northeast, there might be some opportunities. So I think there's still big opportunities, and I still um, state governments are the ones who are making the effort in here. Excellent, Eduardo. How about you and your unique uh, unique situation? Yeah, I can subscribe uh, perfectly to what my colleagues, particularly Saul, has. Uh, mentioned that we need to be very strategic and selective in, in which areas do we start to grow. There's, in my view, uh, both ways of growing the supply base uh, of Mexican or regional uh, content. That is organically, and that means through education, through certification, qualification, and competitiveness, start to develop uh, the capability to provide and to, to cater to the already complex and big industry that we have in, in Mexico, and particularly in Baja. That's the organic way. The inorganic, I will call it, is to pull existing supply chain 
to come over, we go back to the discussions of point of use availability. In my previous life, the company that I, I run for 11 years, uh, also on the orthopedic uh, device uh, market, we created something out of need and out of desire for our own company that we call the supplier seminar. And we went, uh, all, all, of course, coordinating with uh, some governmental entities already disappeared, like ProMexico, uh, to knock on the doors of suppliers uh, in the US and, and worldwide to come down to our facility for a three-day seminar. And the idea behind it was to see, uh, like us, that are anchor companies that consume a lot of materials and products, uh, come and see what we have and, and, and what we need. And then we ended up pulling two companies, two very significant uh, big companies uh, down to the Tijuana uh, region just to provide us with textiles and do our laminations and things like that. But we also source, for instance, titanium, steel, and, and we're mining and then sourcing it from places like Russia, New Zealand, Australia. And it, it will be very impossible actually to, 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 to make that supply base local. But uh, for natural reasons, but there's a whole spectrum of products and, and com competitiveness uh, capabilities that, that we can explore. Our content right now locally is around 7%, so ways to go. Uh, we have a couple more minutes before uh, our keynote speaker, but uh, uh, can one of you comment on the availability of power and water in Mexico? Is that an issue, Eduardo? How do you feel about getting good water, good electricity? Definitely the infrastructure, it's, it's a pain point that we have that it's under review and uh, we are as a manufacturing community uh, doing our work that is giving visibility to that limited. Uh, I still see that as a, as a weak point in our supply uh, chain, but something that is being addressed. Hmm. So will any comments from you on water and electricity? Yeah, I think infrastructure in general, it's a, it's a big issue. And once again, um, we need to bring into this table smart government representatives. So in terms of Baja, we're in the change in, in close to an election process. But further down the road, this has, has to be a, a good um, area where we have to work together. So I think there's a, uh, we're, we have enough with, for what we're uh, currently supporting, but in terms of the future, we have to look into a, a more investment in terms of, in general, infrastructure. Yeah, that's excellent. Well, I'm going to try to wrap it up here. Um, we're almost at the time, but you're all very smart people, very accomplished people. So thank you very much. Uh, on behalf of myself, Dean Ordonias, Jimmy, the University of California, San Diego, and ISC, I thank you very much, gentlemen. Thanks. Thanks for your insights. Appreciate it. Dr. Shin, I'll turn it over to you now. So. We, you can transition to the uh, next speaker. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Pamnesh. What an exciting discussion. It was great to have all of you as a panelist. And now I'm even more excited to introduce you, um, Emilio Cadena, as our featured speaker. Um, Emilio will talk about uh, how to successfully expanding your business in Mexico. Um, Emilio is the CEO of Grupo Prodenza, which is a consulting company responsible for and part of over a thousand projects of 14 companies establishing operations in Mexico. Emilio is also a current president of the board of the US-Mexico Foundation in Washington, DC. He's also a board member of the American Chamber of Commerce Mexico and a current member of Mexico's Business Council Steering Committee for NAFTA renegotiation. So again, I'm delighted to have Emilio with us. It's all yours, Emilio, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, first of all, to, to be after my friend Felipe and Eduardo and the rest of the panelists is always a challenge. So uh, hi to, to all of you. Uh, great to hear your comments. Uh, I think they, these, these are people that have been in the industry for a long time in Mexico, and it's great to, to listen to them and, and learn from them every single time. So congratulations to, to the university for bringing this, uh, such a great panel. I will talk about the, the binational trade uh, in today's context, and I think this is where we are going to look at what type of opportunities we have okay, uh, in, uh, in the region. I certainly would speak from the Mexican point of view, but I think this is also applicable to the United States. And I will try to explain why. 
Uh, the first thing, this is a graph on the correlation of our trade between the US and Mexico. It was already pretty close before 1994. But I think one of the things that we see is that, so, sorry, is that it's obvious that after 1994, the correlation is identical. I mean, we go up and down uh, directly with what happens in the United States. And one of the most important reasons for this um, is this is uh, the production, in, the industrial production in the US and the manufacturing production in the United States from 2015 to today. Of course, you see the dip there of COVID. Uh, and I just use this as an example to make this case. This graph, which is not in the same scale, but it's identical in terms of behavior. This is the manufacturing production in Mexico. That is the reason why after USM, after NAFTA, and now we will continue with USM, uh, USMCA, is that the main activity in Mexico today, the pillar of the Mexican economy is the industrial sector, not the primary sector like oil it was in the past. Uh, that changed with, USM, uh, with NAFTA and the correlation is completely direct. That is that uh, Mexico's economy would always be following what's happening in the US, pulled by the manufacturing for export sector in Mexico, by companies or, uh, like Eduardo and like Felipe, we're saying, and like what we do for business. Uh, but this is uh, the, the relationship that we have today. So one of the things that we believe is that this is a great opportunity for many other companies. This is just a few numbers on what we do for business. We've been in the business for 35 years. We used to be what I would call a NAFTA company, not anymore because it doesn't exist. So we are now a USMCA company, but we are one of the success stories of the transition of the region. Uh, we started with three people, this company. Today, we are the leader in the type of services we offer. We've been ranked by the, the, as the best place to work for young people in Mexico. We have presence all, not only in Mexico, in 13 different cities in Mexico, but also we have presence in the United States, in Texas, in Chicago. We have offices in the Czech Republic. We have offices in Shanghai. So what I wanted to say is that the amount of impact for small and medium-sized enterprises that USM, uh, NAFTA brought initially and that today USMCA brings is huge. And I think this is one of the untold stories of the success of uh, this integration, this regional integration between Canada, US and Mexico, although today I'm speaking more about the US-Mexico relationship. And this is not unique to Mexico. And I think this is one of the things that we have to, to understand. If you look at a picture of McAllen, Texas, or Laredo, Texas, uh, or El Paso for that matter, before the integration of our two economies and what you see today, the change is uh, outstanding. The amount of well-being that has been generated by this integration and an integration that by no means is perfect, but I think has been fabulous for the economy. So you have a company that we started 35 years ago, again, with three people, and, uh, and today we are able to be one of the leaders in the market of uh, attracting and operating manufacturing uh, facilities in Mexico. So uh, what I would say is, how is Mexico a key player in this binational trade opportunity? Some of the things our panelists were talking about them uh, a little bit earlier. Uh, I will try to, to discuss some of them in a little bit more detail. And I think there's basically two great opportunities uh, for investing in Mexico and for investing in the region. Because one of the things that we will talk about is this opportunity of investing in the region is not only for Mexican or American companies, but I think companies worldwide. And we'll talk about that. Two big sectors, one is manufacturing, which is going to continue to grow and we'll talk about that. And then of course, the digital economy, digital commerce and technology is one sector that is growing tremendously in the region, of course, is growing tremendously in the world. But I think based on the characteristics of Mexico also and of the region, we have significant areas of opportunities. Why uh, opportunities in the supply chain integration? First, I think is the US economy recovery. Uh, we continue to say that 
uh, the economic recovery of the United States, we know, is the priority of President Biden. Of course, health, uh, but health is directly related to the, econ the economic recovery. Without the health ingredient, we are not going to be able to have an economic recovery, which at the end of the day is what people are suffering the most, okay? The other thing that is happening in Mexico is that by this uh, activation of the US economy, which has been evident, and with a lot of money invested by the United States into this recovery, Mexican operations uh, reactivate very, very quickly. Uh, we do have the possibility, as our panelists were saying, of having Mexican operations that are extremely productive in North America, okay? Mexico has a very diversified industrial platform. This also allows us to reactivate very quickly, although not all sectors are uh, uh, reactivating at the same pace. For example, I'm sure Felipe uh, talked a little bit about aerospace. Aerospace is going to be uh, take a little bit longer, but for example, the electric electronic sector uh, is, uh, we can keep up to build hardware for cloud computing, which a lot of it is built in Mexico. Uh, now to build construction equipment, et cetera, uh, we are having a tremendous amount of activity uh, in the region, especially the center and the north part of Mexico. The other thing that we have been doing really well is that the protocols to manage COVID have been implemented very successful in uh, operation, okay? We have over 15,000 people in our operations today, and we have uh, less than 0.5% of people with, even though that we're seeing a curve to go up in Mexico as, as the country, we have uh, less than 0.5% uh, of the population of our factories with a, a, a contagious of, uh, with any uh, issue related to COVID. Fortunately, also, we, we haven't had any issue with uh, people passing away from this, which is great in terms of our direct employees. Uh, so I think this is another thing that we have learned. We have become, as we have been in the past, part of what I call a secure and safe supply chain. And this is extremely important for the North American region, that Mexico is part of this secure and safe supply chain, okay? And the other thing is that we are not in recovery mode today from the manufacturing for export for the supply chain um, part of, of Mexico in this integration in North America. We are now in growth. And, and I will show you some of the numbers here challenging your, your site a little bit. But as you can see, these are the metrics of the IMEX uh, companies in Mexico. And IMEX is Industria Ma Maquiladora y Manufacturera de Exportación in Mexico. This is the program that most of us use to be part of this integrated supply chain. And as you can see, most of the metrics, okay, have been going up. The, the two in the, in the bottom is how much we represent of the overall uh, uh, exports in Mexico and the overall imports in Mexico, which we are not as high as we have been in the past, which I don't necessarily think that's bad news. But as you can see, on number of establishments, on number of jobs, on creation of jobs, uh, on how much we represent from the formal employment, the amount of imports and the amount of exports we have, all have been growing. The amount of imports is extremely important for the United States, by the way, and I'll touch on this. But one of the good things of Mexico and the good things for the region is that the most profitable import into the United States is an import from Mexico. Every dollar the US imports from Mexico has at least 40 cents of US content. This doesn't happen with any other import from the United, to the United States from any other part of the world. So the, the return on investment of the Mexican import is much higher than any other place in the world, okay? And number two, in terms of opportunities, we are seeing this, what we call regionalization of manufacturing. Uh, this near shoring and reshoring initiative, we had seen it before uh, this, mainly driven by the fourth industrial revolution, which for me has to do with the first time in history where the consumer actually has the absolute power to decide what they want, when they want it, and how they want things built. In order for us to satisfy this new demand of the customer, 
we have to be closer to the markets. The reaction time, speed to market becomes more relevant than cost. And that's why we are seeing regionalization of manufacturing. And basically what we see is North American production assets for the North American market, Asian production assets for the Asia market. And we'll talk a little bit about that. And of course, European uh, production assets for Europe uh, as the three main markets, I would say, in the world. Uh, the other thing is that it happened, I would say, with a social and political transition in the world where we went from uh, globalization to this managed trade uh, environment, public policy and political pressure certainly accelerated this reshoring and, and nearshoring of, um, of production, not only with public policy or, or tariffs, but also I'm going to say with narrative uh, in terms of we want to buy American or we want to buy regional, et cetera. I, I have to say, I, I, I confess that I tend to be a free trader uh, for the most part, but I'm also very pragmatic and I understand the social and political situation of the world today is not the same. That's why USMCA and NAFTA are not the same type of agreements and we'll touch on that. And then lastly, this nearshoring and reshoring, certainly COVID accelerated it, as many other things. Uh, and basically moving not only from just-in-time production, but just-in-case production. I think business continuity has become the most relevant discussion at the C-suite of uh, organizations. And all of this brings opportunities for businesses, uh, but also for newcomers into the market to understand how we solve this new environment uh, of manufacturing. Uh, third, the trade war, which uh, I, I, I don't necessarily like the term, but we certainly have a lot of tension uh, between the United States and China. We see it on the press. We believe it's going to continue to happen. And here, the new term that we are seeing, and, and we uh, prepare a paper from the US-Mexico Foundation, where I have the privilege of being the chairman, called Ally Shoring. And I believe this is going to be a new concept from the social and political point of view that we need to have in, in, in the top of our, of our mind uh, in order to capitalize on it. And, and I'll touch on Ally Shoring a little bit. Uh, we can capitalize this opportunity by working together. And then I always say, be careful what we wish for. And I'll explain also on that. Very quickly on the case and path uh, of development for Ally Shoring in Mexico, and this is the paper prepared by the US-Mexico Foundation uh, with the intellectual uh, work of Elaine Desensky and John Austin, uh, both of them from the Midwest of the United States, uh, understanding very well why ally shoring, which this is the definition that we are using. Ally shoring describes the program of sourcing essential materials, goods, and services uh, with trusted friends. Uh, while disengaging uh, China and other states across uh, who uh, undermine American interests. Again, this is the paper that is being prepared by them. Uh, and this is part of the environment that we are seeing today. And as uh, business uh, people, we have to understand that this is happening. And basically what we are saying is these are the benefits for the United States and Mexico if they uh, go into this ally shoring program. If they become friendlier and design the institutional architecture to become friendlier on how we deal with each other, okay? <laughs> Which is a uh, reduced reliance on critical supplies from China. Our panel was talking about that. Uh, facilitate rapid containment and treatment of COVID-19. Reinforce critical supply chains. Uh, support recovery from the pandemic. Okay, uh, the, the economic recovery, foster the creation of jobs and growth uh, of export in industries that we are developing together. I think this is already happening. I think there is a very interesting case, for example, in Sonora, Arizona, with investment of Lucid Motors in, uh, in Arizona, and the use of the supply chain of Nogales and Hermosillo to make sure that the project of Lucid Motors in Arizona is successful. Uh, so we have a lot of the success stories. I think we have to put the puzzle together much better in order for us to be able to capitalize and to become 
this dream that we have of being the most competitive region in the world, okay? Uh, then it's not only the economic side, but the institutional side and building the institution uh, that would allow us to work together to reduce corruption, to strengthen rule of law, et cetera, okay? Uh, number seven, also discussed by our panels, we need to do something to build critical infrastructure together. Uh, and I'll, I'll discuss that on some uh, uh, coming slides. Um, and again, contribute to the economic and political health of the United States and Mexico. We have seen that the integration has created benefits. Uh, the numbers are uh, certainly uh, well in favor of continuing with the integration. Again, not perfect. Uh, we, we realized when we started the negotiation of NAFTA, uh, then NAFTA, that we did not take care of the people left behind in all changes. Uh, and I think this is something that we have to consider because it's not only related to integration of supply chain, but also what's happening with the world and, and with the way business runs. And I think we have a new threat that is much bigger than uh, the threat that we have when we went global as corporations, which is the digital transformation of the world, where a lot of people can be left out if we don't do something about it. But again, that's certainly uh, opportunities that we can capitalize on, okay? Uh, as I said, the 40 cents per dollar, the most profitable input into the United States is for Mexico. And the amount of jobs that directly depend, directly only, indirectly there's many more, on the trade between Mexico and the United States is huge. Uh, so these are some of the recommendations that we are pushing from the integration of supply chain task force from Mexico and the United States. We have to work at it together. And it's not only Washington DC and Mexico City. We need to integrate as you're doing today, uh, as the University of San Diego is doing today, we need to integrate the local, regional and federal uh, communities to work together uh, to build this solution uh, and extremely important. We need to make sure that we redesign, rebuild in some cases and, um, and, and empower institutional architecture in the, in the countries, institutional architecture to deal with the, bilater the bilateral relationship. So we are not depending on a presidency in the United States or a presidency in Mexico to make sure that we continue down this path. We learn from the past and we actually move forward with this. And one of the most important things for us is trade facilitation. We still have a very bureaucratic border between Mexico and the United States. And for us to become the region that we need to, we need to figure out a better way to have trade facilitation. And I would say trade facilitation for trusted traders. This is something extremely important to consider because the authorities in the United States that control the border is Homeland Security. Security number one priority for them. The authorities that control uh, the border in Mexico is uh, El SAT, uh, which is the tax authorities. So tax collection and control is the number one priority. So we have two different objectives which impact the productivity and the efficiency of the border. We need to figure out how we are gonna have efficient programs to make this happen. Um, and then on the opportunities, and this is be careful what we wish for. I say, you know, the, the elephant in the room, more so the dragon in the room, which is China. I would say for most of us, uh, China is not the enemy. And I'm talking from the uh, private sector point of view. They are actually critical partners in our supply chain. The semiconductor issue, transistors, et cetera, is one of the best examples, is the best example that we have today. And although in some cases they're fierce competitors and not always playing by the rules, and I'm not talking about the corporation, I'm talking about the country. This is, a, for me, one of the most important things that we must change. I hope that we as a global community can figure out a way to do it, not through a trade war, but through cooperation. Uh, I think this is extremely important because developing these supply chains is not an easy task. We have to, to make sure that we understand that the technology and processes that went global uh, 20, 25 years ago, uh, some of them going, of course, to Asia, are not the same technologies that we need today. And those technologies have been developed in many cases by American or European companies, 
but in coordination with Chinese people and with Chinese corporations. The Chinese are extremely sophisticated. Uh, in, in my case, they deserve a lot of respect for what they have done. Regardless of that, I believe that the rules of international trade uh, have to be much better with them and the transparency of the process have to be much better for them. So uh, the best example for me is the TVs that we used to manufacture that were huge and then went to China are not the TVs that we have today. Today, if you want to have a device with a flat screen, it's almost impossible to do it at a competitive price without buying something from China. Uh, and of course, then we have the other issue that the Chinese market is a very important growth market for us as corporations. So this is why I am not in the, in the let me say, in favor of this trade war, but really cooperation. But again, understanding where the world is moving to. Okay, and, and this is why I say China's diversification is easier with China, or I would say China's diversification is easier with Chinese companies, which is not easy to, the, to differentiate between Chinese companies and China as a country. Uh, and that is a, a completely different conversation and almost getting to the end to see if we have some time for Q and A's. Of course, another great opportunity is USMCA. It protects access to the market. And I think Mexico has a sensational opportunity to capitalize this access to the market. That is on the near shoring and reshoring opportunity and ally shoring opportunities. I think the landing strip uh, to become part of this new reality uh, goes through Mexico. Uh, the team was talking a lot about uh, that, the, the previous panel. And I think one of the main advantages we have is our demographics. Employment of choice for industrial uh, uh, processes for young people, Mexico is extremely attractive. That is, we have a lot of people that are uh, 18, 19, 20, 21 years old, 22, of course, more, that see in manufacturing for export world-class facilities, world-class working conditions, world-class compensation packages, of course, less than, than uh, the wages in the United States, but still much, much better than other industries in Mexico. Uh, a lot of social mobility in this sector in Mexico, which is another big subject to talk about. Uh, and this is not the case in the United States. Full uh, industrialization in the United States as it was uh, in the, at the end of the 80s is not possible mainly because of talent. The employment of choice today in the United States is not manufacturing is the technology uh, sector, financial sector, et cetera. So this is something important to, to also to consider. Uh, and then of course, the last big opportunity I see, I don't elaborate too much on it here, but I believe is the growth on digital commerce and tech. Uh, just as an example, the growth of Amazon, the growth of Mercado Libre and the rest of the platforms in Mexico in this, uh, in the last, three uh, to, to four years has been huge. Of course, through the pandemic, it has been um, outstanding, but it has been huge. But it's not only that side of the technology side. Uh, companies like Intuit moving their solution uh, to, to manage uh, for SMEs to manage their business, to pay taxes, uh, everything that is happening with cloud computing and cloud solutions, uh, we are just getting into big data and artificial intelligence and RPAs and, of course, Internet of Things. Uh, this is a great opportunity for companies to invest in Mexico, to grow in Mexico, to capitalize the market. We are 130 million people, most of us with a mobile device. Uh, the opportunities are gigantic. And uh, today they are opportunities, but tomorrow they are going to be survival. So I think for anybody on this type of... Uh, business, Mexico is a great opportunity for growth. Um, and then lastly, I think three main challenges I see. One is the local agendas, the local agenda of the United States and the local agenda of Mexico. Uh, I put some examples here, uh, USMCA implementation, for example, we have a complex labor chapter, environmental chapter and a respect for investment or a certainty for investment, which have been controversial and in the news, we can talk about it. Uh, and of course, the environmental agenda of the Biden-Harris administration is not aligned as well as the energy agenda with 
the agenda of Lopez Obrador in his administration. Immigration is extremely complex. And before we used to be able to manage trade issues, immigration issues, security issues, today really the interaction between the countries is all of it together. It's like one full package where we start defining vaccine access, uh, assuming that we can get into deals with immigration or security. And of course, the Buy American Initiative, which I hope for us to be really successful as a region, uh, maybe it would be better to say uh, by USMCA, not by American. But I understand where we are in terms of the political and social environment. Uh, number two is the economic recovery of their COVID. Are we going to have a recovery or not? Are we going to have a new wave or additional waves coming in? in implementation of protocols, what are they going to be in the future? Uh, most important for me is what are we really going to do on SME support? I think we still talk a lot about SMEs, but still not strong, uh, solid uh, policy and support for SMEs to thrive in the region. I believe, I still believe much more in Mexico than in the US that SMEs are on their own. Uh, and we need to make sure that this is one of the lessons learned of this new economic era is that we make sure that we include SMEs on our growth, uh, especially if we leave them out of digital transformation, of access to financing, uh, I think it's going to be a very, very difficult uh, uh, coming years for SMEs in the region. And then regional coordination and travel restrictions. We need to figure out what's, who are essential sectors, how we deal with them, uh, how we travel from one place to the other. And this is something that I believe is a big challenge. And I still see a lot of areas of opportunity, although I believe this high level economic dialogue that has been uh, defined again by Biden and by Lopez Obrador to establish again the high level economic dialogue is part of this institutional architecture of this bilateral institutional architecture that we must recover. And lastly, is the regional competitiveness. Here I put Mexico uh, because in the ranking of the region, uh, when you look at the IMD World Competitiveness Center, which is the ranking that I like the most, Canada is the best in terms of the region, okay? Uh, where it's number eight compared to 10 in the United States, but Mexico is 53, okay? And look at this, the digital ranking and the talent ranking still, we need to close this gap and to do a lot of work on this area. Now, of course, this is taking averages uh, in, the, in the countries. If you look at uh, Monterrey, or if you look at Querétaro, or if you look at Tijuana, or you look at Ciudad Juarez, of course, Mexico is going to be much better in terms of the ranking, but at the end of the day is the region. And same thing in the United States, if you look at Illinois, or you look at Ohio, or California, or Texas, it's not the same as if you look at Alabama, or Louisiana, uh, or Mississippi. So we need to have I, I would hope that we can build a regional competitiveness plan where we move into infrastructure, into efficiency of business, into efficiency of our border, into digital growth, into the development of talent, so we can be where we uh, should be for the coming years. So again, many opportunities. Certainly Mexico plays a big role on it. And I think it's in, in our holding of hands to seize the opportunities is not only on the Mexico uh, side, I think it has to be on the combination, on the bilateral combination to seize these opportunities. Uh, and with this, I, I would finish my presentation and maybe uh, I see Eduardo still there. I have the luxury of seeing you in my screen and Matur and uh, so anything that, um, Anybody wants to, to have a question, talk about, disagree, of course, uh, then I'm more than open to do it. To have Great. That. <laughs> Thank you very much, Emilio. Just for the interest of time, let me wrap it up here. One thing that I would like to say here is this is just the beginning, right? I mean, this is not the end of the symposium that we will have. We will have the follow-ups. And what I see is we had a lot of opportunities, exactly like Emilio said, but at the same time, that opportunity comes with a lot of challenges we need to overcome. So we will continue to this journey. And with that, let me wrap up. I would like to, first of all, thank Emilio, thank all the speakers and the panelists. In addition, 
Uh, without their help, this could not have done. I would like to thank Bob Nash. I would like to thank uh, Jimmy, Lisa, Monique. And also lastly, I would also like to thank Jody, uh, Melanie and Dan, uh, who actually arranged all the details behind the scene. Thank you very much.